everyone, it's Abby with an update from the third task. Confusion has spread across the stands as we have just witnessed Cedric Diggory and Harry Potter tandemly take the cup and disappear. As we wait for their reappearance, let's take a look at the task thus far. Professors Moody, Flitwick, Hagrid, and McGonagall are acting patrollers, available to rescue a champion who wishes to forfeit the cup at the cost of the help. Bagman sent champions into the maze in three waves. First, Potter and Diggory, followed by Crumb, and last, Miss Delacour. Potter and Diggory, the only pair to enter together, split ways at the first fork. We saw Diggory fight off last-ended Scroots, Potter take on a Bogart initially, mistaken as a Dementor, we heard a blood-curdling scream from Fleur, and we witnessed Crumb use an unforgivable curse on Cedric, but with help from Harry, he was able to continue on the task. However, Crumb was out at that point. Harry and Cedric then again part ways and Potter encounters a sphinx. They had a conversation, no word on yet what the content was, but whatever it was, Potter must have pleased the beast as he was allowed to pass. Then, only moments ago, both Potter and Diggory are within view of the cup. It seemed that Cedric would capture the cup until a giant spider stood in his way. Potter defends Diggory again, forfeiting an easy win while Diggory took on the spider himself. The two champions take on the beast, and after some debate, they claim the cup together. It was beautiful until we realized they were gone. No one seems to know if this was part of the task or some mistake, but officials are clearly worried. We will keep you updated as new developments arise. Until then, we're just waiting at the cup. It's been an exciting night. Um, hopefully they get back soon. Well, hello there, and welcome back to the podcast that must not be named. I'm Melissa. I am Luke. And we are here discussing Harry Potter. Potter and the Goblet of Fire, chapter number 31, the third task. This chapter was 31 pages. It's a theme of numbers tonight, and that's 4.22% of this book. Let's go ahead and find out what happened. Harry tells Ron and Hermione everything that he saw in the pensive. The trio spends the next days before the third task helping him study the new hexes. The morning of the third task arrives and a new article from Rita Skeeter has appeared discussing Harry's fainting and divination. Hermione, with an inspiration, sprints from the hall to the library. Harry meets with Bill and Mrs. Weasley, who've come to support him, and the trio spend the rest of the morning walking around the grounds as the other students still have final exams. At dusk, the school heads to the Quidditch pitch to find a giant hedge maze filling it. Cedric and Harry are tied for the lead, so they enter the maze together first. Harry faces a few challenges in the maze, including a bug art disguised as a Dementor, a mist which turns the world upside down, and one of Hagrid's scroots. After passing them, he hears Cedric struggling on the opposite side of the hedge, and he blasts his way through to find him being attacked by Crumb, who uses the Cruciatus curse on him. Harry stuns Crumb and helps Cedric up, and the two part ways again. Harry is confronted by a giant sphinx who presents a riddle, which Harry gets right and is allowed to pass. As he nears the middle of the maze, he can see the cup, but Cedric is just ahead of him when the two's way is blocked by a giant spider. Harry and Cedric work together to defeat the spider. Both reach the cup at the same time, and after a debate of who should win, they decide to take it together. They do, and the cup, it turns out, is a board game. Alrighty there, Luke. So we had some new people. Yeah, we did. We did. Can you? Who were some of the people that we saw for our character introductions? There were there were quite a few. I feel like I may have missed a couple because there was a pretty long chapter and a lot of different scenes. But the ones that I know for sure we met for the first time were both of Crumb's parents. At least in the same room as them, we got slight descriptions of them. We didn't really interact with them, but they were there. Um, same thing with Fleur's mother. She was there with with Gabrielle. Um, we also met Cedric's mother for the first time. Um, we've met his father Amos a few times, but his mother was there for this one. We the other character that we met. This is one of those we had to kind of decide: is this a character introduction or is this a magic vocabulary? It was the actual Sphinx itself, because um, we had never heard of it and it had speaking lines, so it gets named as a character in our book. Which we are really not at all consistent with choosing, but this time that's the way we went. Well, again, I think it's, yeah, no, it is, it's been a little inconsistent, but sorry. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so we had a couple of mentions. I, I'm going to botch this. Oh, you got it. As I do. I'm going to call it a Pollyon Pringle. Yep, a Pollyon Pringle. The, the past caretaker. Mm-hmm. Prior to Filch, you think? I would or assume that... so. Or there okay. could have been some in between. It's not really specified. It's just in that day. He was the caretaker in that day. Okay. And then Og. Is that one of the um, goblins? Is that correct? No. No, that was um, actually another person that was there during Molly's time at school. Oh, the gamekeeper. The gamekeeper at that time. That's right. All right. Um, we had a new location, sort of. Yeah, kind of. I mean, technically, we've been in that space before because it's on the Quidditch field, but we've never been on the Quidditch field walled in by um, hedges. A, a repurposed so, location? There you go. So we're going we're to call it the location of inside the maze. Yes. Yep. All right. And then what are some magic cabulae? There were there was quite a bit. This here. is another one. I feel like I may have missed something somewhere, but uh, my list includes impedimenta, which is the incantation for the impediment jinx, which we heard about, I think, two chapters back when they started training. Um, the reductor curse. We learned about the four point spell whose incantation is point me, one of the most different type of incantations we've really seen. Mo most direct vocabulary on it, at least. Um, we learned about a shield charm, which I could justify not really being included here, but it was capitalized as specifically shield charm. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Right, like it was named here right. as opposed yeah. to trying to put up a shield. Yeah, I, I'll count it. Yeah, and the first time I could find of the use of a jelly legs jinx as well. Interesting. I know. I double checked. I it didn't come up at any other point. I again. I, I tried searching in the Kindle. It gets weird on hyphenated words sometimes. So I'm thinking maybe it didn't. But as far as I can tell, it's the first time it's been used. Okay. Well, then I will go with your professional judgment on that one. The last bit of magic vocabulary that I found was the golden mist. Um, yes. One of the obstacles. So I'm sure we'll have more to say about that here in a little bit. I agree. All right. Um, and then we had an illustration. Oh, yeah. Which I remembered and even have a book in front of me. So improvement. <laughs> and it looks like it's the Sphinx. I would say it's definitely the Sphinx. I mean, it's it's not a golden mist. <laughs> it's not like any golden mist I've seen before, at least. And, you know, it, a sentient cloud of uh, a sentient what is it a sentient patch of haze yes named deb. yes <laughs> definitely not a picture of deb so this is a sphinx so it a lion's tail yep had had the body of an over large lion great clawed yeah. paws and a yellowish uh -huh. tail ending in a brown tuft its head however was that of a woman she turned her long almond shaped eyes upon harry as he approached so, yeah, that is a really accurate picture to go with that description. Yeah, I feel like I was actually just telling you what I saw in the picture, but that's how JK described it. Nice job, Marie Grandpre. Very good. All righty. All right, so this chapter was, we used the word dense. Yes, there were a there lot of things. <laughs> There were things. There were all the things, right? Many, many of things. Many of the things. Okay, so I'm just going to jump in and start talking and we'll go from there. Because it kind of looks like I have notes on the things and you're just going to comment on my notes of the things. Yeah, but I have things highlighted throughout. There's, yeah, we'll be fine. All right, here we go. So at the very beginning, it starts with, once again, Harry recapping what happened in the previous chapter <laughs> for Ron and Hermione? I feel like I have said that sentence a thousand times already in this book because that's how the chapters start. Harry has to tell Ron and Hermione about everything they missed. And then we have a chapter and they miss more stuff in the next chapter. Harry has to tell Ron and Hermione. I sense the theme. Anyway, it happened again. Only this time, Ron's reaction is all of us, right? Like Ron reacts how we all react. And he's like, wait, hold on. And Dumbledore, he trusts Snape, even though he knows he was a Death Eater. <laughs> I feel like that's that's everybody going, are, are you sure that's what he said? Mm -hmm. are, are you like he, he actually said he trusts Snape? Because the disbelief is um, it, it's definitely a common feeling, I believe, at this point. Yeah, it's pretty reasonable. Like we always 
you know, we, we've talked about this, I know. Like, there's been a lot of reasons to distrust Snape, but, like, there's also, like, yeah, he saved Harry's life in, in book one, I guess. Kind of. He tried, he did his best to protect him, at least, it seems like. But, like, yeah. this is, this is, like... He put effort in. Maybe he tried his best might be <laughs> a stretch. Ironclad, definitive proof that he was one of the bad guys. Like, how do you, like, literally in the group of the baddies like their name is death eater <laughs> like uh, yeah not a good group and like what is it that came up between dumbledore and and snape that albus dumbledore one of the most intelligent people we've seen in this book and yes we know he's oh so trusting like oh he gives people a chance and maybe that seems foolhardy at times and this is another one of those examples of like how has the wool been pulled over Albus's eyes somehow? Or, like, is is he missing something? But, I don't know. It's a totally valid thing that Ron's like, really? Like, <laughs> like it's not just conjecture? Like, we know this now? Like, this is actually true? Like, like this is something even Hermione can't argue against? Right, right. So, I think it's a, <laughs> a pretty good pickup by Ron, for sure. I agree. Okay, and then I want to kind of jump to the morning of the task and and the newspaper article. Okay. Okay. So the newspaper article was titled Harry Potter, Disturbed and Dangerous. And I realized that there was a lot of hearsay and she got a lot of things wrong and, you know, she's kind of the worst and Malfoy's the worst. I get that. But is Rita Skeeter really wrong? About him being disturbed and dangerous? Yeah. So go with me on this. So I, I was reading the article again going... Okay, her slant of purposely trying to uh, like drum up a story and she always has a negative slant. That that's not right. But let's look at it objectively, right? So he did collapse in pain. He did say it was his scar. We know that the scar was inflicted by you know who. We know that he speaks parcel tongue. We know that that information was withheld from the public. And we know that the people he chooses to be friends with can be seen as a questionable associates from common folk who are removed from the facts, such as Hagrid, the half giant, and Lupin, the werewolf. So while her slant is very negative and um, like she's trying to draw drum up, you know, a fever or whatever, but she's not necessarily wrong in that the perception of these things when combined together in one person can be a little sketchy. Oh yeah. No. And you know, like they say, you know, every lie has at least a, a kernel of the truth or whatever. This has about 30 kernels of truth to it, which make it even more plausible that people would read this and believe right. this. And like, yeah, we the only reason we're so upset by some of the other things that she's written is because we literally saw those conversations happen and saw right. them get twisted. But like the information tends to still be somewhat true into a to a point like enough, like looking at Hermione and Harry, they spend a lot of time together and it would not be a crazy leap of faith to say, you know, maybe they're dating and oh, now she's dating Victor Crumb like that that could be tough on Harry. You know, like it's when you just throw it out there. Guess what? It, yeah, I can see why people would lap it up for sure, because people like gossip. People like to know about the celebrities. People like to know about famous Harry Potter and his traumatic life. And I mean, we read about it. Us. We, we read about it. But right. in, the, like in the news, it. like that would sell as well, right? If you have this tragic mm -hmm. hero and then you can get a little bit more scoop about how his school life isn't great either. Like, yeah, of course that's going to sell. Like, I'm, I'm not surprised that she's doing what she's doing. And when you aren't sitting here reading his life chapter by chapter from a perspective that's fairly close to him. Um, yeah, I could see why people would would believe it. For sure. I mean, they're wrong. It's wrong because she takes the kernels and, and puts them in a different order than they actually are. But mm -hmm. like, it's all based on true facts. And that's the scariest part of it all. Okay. Yes. Also speaking about the morning and, and jumping off the Rita Skeeter thing. Hermione does this whole Hermione thing, right? Well, but she, oh, I can't. Oh, Just I really hate. It. I know that's not. I really hate when she does that. It's, it's, been, it's been a few times. Yeah, right? Right, with... I've got, uh, I got an idea. The Basilisk I've to the library. was the first big one. Which one? The Basilisk. Yes. Yeah. And that didn't really work out for you, did it? No. No, it, it didn't. 
I'm just saying, could you take in one extra minute, tell us what you think, then go run off and prove. Right. I mean, I get it. She's It's 10 minutes before they have an exam and she wants to try. I, I mean, I do see at least the timing makes sense of why they didn't tell her or why she didn't tell them, I should say. But I just was like, oh, she's doing it again. Come on, Hermione. Come on, JK. <laughs> Give me the answer. <laughs> I don't want to wait and have to figure it out for myself. Just tell me. Yeah. I was frustrated. A couple of quick thoughts on the night before that, actually. Um, mm-hmm. I have a couple of things highlighted. And one of the big things is Harry basically looking at Neville when he's sleeping and feeling sympathy for him. And it's just a really nice kind of moment between Harry and Neville. Like, it's 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 really sweet because Harry's a little bit handcuffed he like he it's almost like he wants to do something and like you know kind of tell neville but he can't and so like he's he's kind of emotionally handcuffed to do anything to start bridging that gap between those two and it's just a it's a nice little passage there um it says he often got sympathy from strangers for being an orphan but as he listened to neville's snores he thought that neville deserved it more than he did Lying in the darkness, Harry felt a rush of anger and hate toward the people who had tortured Mr. and Mrs. Longbottom. He remembered the jeers of the crowd as Crouch's son and his companions had been dragged from the court by the Dementors. He understood how they had felt. Then he remembered the milky white face of the screaming boy and realized with a jolt that he had died a year later. And then it goes into this final thought. It was Voldemort, Harry thought, staring up at the canopy of his bed in the darkness. It all came back to Voldemort. He was the one who had torn those these families apart, who had ruined all their lives, dot, dot, dot. And then it goes into the next day. But I just thought that's a, a pretty nice sentiment from Harry of he's getting angry at, at Voldemort and the whole situation. And the fact that it kind of all leads in from his empathy towards Neville, I, I think is... It's a good Harry moment, I think. I do too. And I think it, it it's so often that Harry and us as observers of Harry really only think about how Harry is feeling and Harry's way of seeing the world. Mm-hmm. And when we and we can see Harry doing this, when Harry can experience what somebody else's world is like, it's a very powerful moment because unlike some characters, Harry actually learns from it. Mm-hmm. And that's nice to see. Absolutely. So let's go into what do you got next? So it's um, after breakfast, right? And they're like, oh, the families are here. And Harry's like, I'm going to go, I don't know, sit at the library or something dumb. And all of a sudden they're like, hey, come here. And it's Bill and Mrs. Weasley. So cool, right? Like all the feels, all yeah. the feels now because <laughs> it's his family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that was a really nice moment because even they, I think they realized that he would not anticipate them being here because she says oh surprise like because i mean he has no reason to believe that they would show up for him i mean other than i mean we we can see that like after the fact it's like okay yeah that makes sense but like they legitimately don't have to do this i mean i think harry has thought of they really she really doesn't think the dursleys are gonna show up does she i thought that was a pretty funny line but i think it's a again a pretty valid thought of like who would be here for me like, right. And, and not then, even like in a pitying kind of way, like literally I, who would be here. Right. It, other than like, okay, Mrs. Weasley and, and Bill, like what anyone from the Weasley family, like, like makes sense when you look at it, but like right. maybe Lupin or like Sirius, mm-hmm. but like they can't be there. Like, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a legitimate, why would, Concern. who would be here? <laughs> Yeah, so, no, I'm with you. But it is a really nice moment when he sees them. And then we kind of get some interactions between the other champions and their families, which are nice. Um, Amos Diggory does his his stuff. Um, and even his wife is like, let's let's let this go <laughs> a bit, uh, which I thought was which was pretty funny. Um, it also mentions how Fleur Delacour notices uh, Bill um, and doesn't yeah. seem to mind the long hair and the the earring shaped like a fang. So I thought that was interesting. And for you, right? She's going to find the prettiest boy in the room. I guess so. Yeah. And we also have the reference to Mrs. Weasley being caught out of her dormitory at four in the, or (laughs) of her dormitory at 4am by the fat lady. And, uh, I love, I love 
Bill's reaction. He goes, what were you doing out of your dormitory at four in the morning? Bill said, Bill surveying his mother with amazement. <laughs> I think like I, I'm trying to put myself in the perspective of like high school. And really for me, it was more like college, like living away from home. Right. And that was like no big deal. Mm hmm. You know, when you're the person doing it, like, you know, you're like, yeah, okay, maybe I shouldn't be up, but I'm not doing anything really wrong. My choice is fine. Mm -hmm. But as a parent looking back and thinking, oh, my kid could do that. Or, oh, if my kid knew I was doing that, <laughs> like, it's very different. It's a tough uh, change to make like mentality, isn't it? Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and I'm running into that, like the freedom that I would have expected to have in general it's not the freedom that I want my children to have, but I know it's not a big deal and and you can just go do it and you'll be fine. But like, yeah, never in a million years would I want my kid to do that. But me doing that, that would be fine. That, okay. You just sure. gotta let go. They'll be fine. I know, but like it's- I, I know, I get it. Seems, I absolutely get it. For Bill, like what, I, I'm sure Bill's like, if you knew I would do was doing that, you would skin me alive because Mrs. Weasley would, mm -hmm. right? She found out that was her kids. But yeah, I just find that highly entertaining. Oh, yeah. And it's I, I think you and I can both uh, relate to that sentiment for sure. Um, also, the flip side of like hearing stories about our parents growing up and we're like, you did what? Uh, we'll leave some of those stories to, to the listener's imagination. But um, riding a motorcycle through your high school. Uh, yeah. OK. Legal drinking with your parents for the first time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's been drinking here for four years. Year. across the river a year. A year. Still, across the river yeah anyway yeah. lots of stories that was our dad um <laughs> anyway and he's listening right now hi dad hi dad <laughs> we love you and we didn't do anything wrong ever all the things we just said that wasn't us i didn't say anything so it was matthew it, it okay. nothing <laughs> <laughs> so i'm gonna talk about percy yeah yeah he's having he's a tough under, time huh he's he's under some like tough observation and heavy scrutiny how do you think he's handling that? Uh, I bet he's working too much to try to fix it. I really think he would easily fall into like the workaholic, like legitimate, like worry about this person, workaholic type level. Like develop ulcers and, and to try and prove almost like going to be such a weird connection. Almost like Ludo Bagman in his trial of like, I thought I was doing the right thing. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? That idea of being kind of young and dumb, even though Percy's not dumb, but in general, just being less mature and, you know, knowledge of the world. He thought he was doing what he was supposed to. He was following what he thought was his boss's orders. He thought he was getting more responsibility. And now he's going to say no to it. Him. You know, he has to turn down the opportunity to do these things for Mr. Crouch. I mean, it's his right. ambition was certainly there. So, yeah. Like, I just see it as like, I didn't know I should know. I don't know what I don't know. And I was trying to do the right thing. Not here I am conspiring to defraud the government or whatever it is they think he's doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. I am going to be sad about Mrs. Weasley one more time. I'm hoping this is the last time I have to be sad about Mrs. Weasley. Mm -hmm. I do not like the way she treats Hermione. And I know it's very quick, and I'm so happy that Harry kind of noticed, first of all, Harry noticed what was going on. Which he is, notices uh, more than I think people give him credit for. I know, but this is so subtle. It's like, I would not expect most people to notice just how, like, low level her shade she was no, talking about. No, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty thick. I thought you it was pretty so? thick. Yeah. I don't know. I was just really thankful that Harry noticed mm -hmm. and stood up for Hermione and, like, said it right. Yeah, and that was that's the, to me the big thing. It's it's one thing to notice it. It's another thing to actually follow through on somebody mm -hmm. that you like and call them out on something that they're doing wrong. And right. that's that's really big of him to do that for his friend. And he did it in a really nice way. It's mm -hmm. not that he was mean or snappy. He was just like, "Hey, do you read this?" Okay, she's not my girlfriend. Yeah, it's like we're it's, really, it's really, really just. We're just gonna fix this problem. problem. It's gonna be fixed. It's not a thing. And the problem's fixed. Yep. <laughs> Done. Good Harry moment for sure. Okay. I'm ready for task three. Are you ready for task three? I think that I am. I oh, think that I go. am. So I'm going to do the slow-mo of the walk of <laughs> Harry and <laughs> Cedric <laughs> walking in. Right. <laughs> I hear like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> 
Dun, 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 dun. That's what I like. I can picture that. Harry walks into ta task three much differently than he did task two. He knows what's coming, sort of. He had time to prepare. He has a plan. I like that he finally seems ready to be a champion. And I don't mean be the winner. I just mean he's acting like a champion should act. And up until this point, I don't think he was. I think you're incredibly perfectly on with that. And I, I hadn't really thought about it that way. But yeah, I mean, it's amazing what preparation will do for your confidence going into something like this. I mean, he doesn't know exactly what's going to be in there, but he's at least given himself some tools that he knows are going to be fairly universally usable. And yeah, no, it's uh, and he's certainly challenged on a few things that he couldn't have anticipated being there, which we'll get there. But it's it's certainly a a much different look than running up to the starting line at, at task two, literally having woken up 10 minutes beforehand. Um, well, or even like task one. Boy, I hope my charm is strong enough to get that broomstick here. Otherwise, I have nothing. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just feel like he has a bag of tricks instead of like a one trick pony. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's totally true the big difference is he's going into a task knowing that it isn't just a one thing like it it's True. a little difference and with the success he's had in those i mean his confidence is is gonna be much much higher on putting right. himself on a relative pedestal with these other three champions like he's proven that he can do them and that's really gonna be, gonna be strong for his uh his self-confidence going into it Okay, so my next kind of thought was once he gets in there, he said this. Harry kept looking behind him. The old feeling that he was being watched was upon him. The old feeling that he was being watched? When was he watched before? This does not seem to be anything I remember from earlier in this book. Do you? Like, does that ring a bell with you at all? Hmm. It could I'm be more of a generic, like everyone knows that feeling like just the well-known feeling of being watched maybe that's what he's getting at like the i mean it could it just it was so oddly worded that like the old feeling of being watched when was that feeling new i think that's the point is it's 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 a human thing that everyone can kind of relate to it's i guess how i read it i don't look at it more of a oh he is hearkening back to a specific scene where he felt like he was being watched um which I'm I'm trying to think. I mean, he's he's had a lot of eyes on him type scenes, and he knew that. But there was also like, oh, your name was just pulled out of the goblet of fire, and what? Um, so yeah, like everyone's all eyes on in the hall or on him kind of thing. But this is a a bit more like something is is trying to get me eyes on me kind of thing. I, I guess I just it felt like there should have been some sort of mention earlier in the book that he felt like this, too. And I just don't recall that happening. That was my only point. I, was that I don't remember him feeling like this earlier. Do you remember him feeling like that earlier? I, not that I can think of in this book. I, not that I can remember. OK, that that was my only kind of thought there. OK. All right. So we're in the maze. Things happen. I'm not like so into talking about all of them that sounds terrible because like it's the task oh they're so exciting though they are so feel free to jump in and talk about anything you want i just want to talk about crumb let's go ahead and talk about crumb i mean there's there's like obstacles which i we'll, we'll touch on cool. here a little bit there may be a five burning question about the obstacles that might be they're cool but like that's it like those are those were cool obstacles what's up with him attacking people yeah i mean like we assume he attacked Fleur, at least the boys do, and then he attacks Cedric. Like, mm -hmm. What's going on with that guy? I don't know. I mean, it's um, seems a bit out of character. I don't know, right? Like, right, because he seems so decent. Every time we've talked to him, he just seems like a, an older kid. Like he's just a kid, right? And I don't think Hermione is that bad of a judge of character, right? Yeah, no, something, something weird. Maybe something in the maze got a hold of him, and you know, like something bit him and the the venom is is changing his you know composure or disposition kind of thing i um, mean because we've even seen him compete before both in the tasks and in the um world cup this it's just it's out of character i think for him so you know attacking people frowned upon yeah yeah i mean we know that he's to be as 
high level of a Quidditch seeker as he is in the world stage, you have to be a pretty competitive person. So right. there could be maybe some ruthlessness behind that that we just haven't seen because it wasn't as back against the wall as this is now. This is the last chance for him to to win. I mean, it's this is it. If he doesn't get it, then that's it. That's true. So okay. I don't know if it's just, you know, final straw, got to pull every stop, and uh, maybe that's what we're seeing. All right. Then the only other thing I really want to comment on is after the Sphinx scene, right? Mm -hmm. Harry figures out the Sphinx is riddle. And the line is, and amazed at his own brilliance, he dashed forward. <laughs> I just think that's funny. That's like, how I live every day of my life. <laughs> right. Like, oh, my, I, 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 I did that. I did that. I did a good I thing. I should not have done that. Dash. And I did it okay. And I did it acceptably well. <laughs> that's the goal, right? Be the okayest everything I can be. I want to be the most acceptably well at things. I want to be 50%. <laughs> I want to hit the 50.5%. Like, that's... <laughs> that's. I just don't want to... As long as I'm not caught by the zombies, right? Right. I, just, I don't have to be fastest. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of the... Uh, hang on, let me see. What did you think of the Sphinx's riddle? Okay, so I read this book the day it came out. It has been a while since it was new. Mm-hmm. I don't ever remember being stumped by the riddle. And I'm not, like, riddles are not kind of my thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember it being that hard. I think it's uh, not a very good riddle, in all honesty. Hey, yeah, like... Two, two I, out of three parts of it. Well, I'll say two out of four parts, because there's four things. There's three things that all add up to one fourth thing, right? So the... First, think of a person who lives in disguise, who deals in secrets and tells naught but lies. Okay. A spy. Reasonable. I'm going right. to say like reasonable, reasonable on that one. Clue. Not bad. Yeah. Next, tell me what's always the last to mend, the middle of middle, and end of the end. That's a good one. I like, yeah, I like, I like the wordplay ones. That's basically, I feel if you like, haven't figured that out. I feel like out. Gollum would approve of that one. Yes. And that's very much why every time I read this part, I think of Gollum and uh, Bilbo in the cave. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a play on the letter D being in yeah. the middle of the word middle, the end of the word end, and it, the last thing to mend, the last letter in mend as well. So good one. I like that one. And finally, give me a sound often heard during the search for a hard to find word. Yeah, I think good. that one's really bad because I have never seen the term ER used for like a uh like a thinking sound other than in the Harry Potter books. <laughs> oh, I have. Right. Either way, it, and maybe it's more of a British way of doing it, but it is not like I would think, oh, um, spy dumb, spy dumb. <laughs> Well, like here's the thing: if I don't know something, that's the, I do say her. I don't. I, I and that's where that's it's just right. like to me. That's it's it's kind of soft. It's it's a little specific to this text, in, in my opinion. When I first read it, because I was I don't remember really ever seeing that anywhere else. <laughs> and she uses it pretty often, usually Ron, but yeah, it's used pretty no, often I, in this. It is used pretty often, and maybe that's why I use it because like it's just part of who mm -hmm. I am now. I don't remember that being that shocking to me. Yeah, no, it, to me, it's just like the first two solid, the last one, eh. and then now string them together and answer me this, which creature would you be unwilling to kiss? I guess it's I just kind of fill in the blank. Like this only, it just makes sense because it's a scary creature uh, to a lot of people. And it's also the thing right behind her. So I, I do like that part of it that it's like, Hey, you're also about to face this. If you think about the answer, um, that's true. But I don't think that's a great overall riddle. Personally. Yeah, it's not the best, but we might. Yeah, no, I agree. It's not great. I like the middle but to middle one, though. <laughs> it serves its purpose. It gets the job and, done. And like the first one's not bad. Yeah, it's fine. It's, I mean, it's I like fine. that he goes with uh, imposter first. He's like imposter. No, no, that's not my guess. That's not my guess. Because he's so afraid that if he says something and it's kind of like, right. well, whatever you say is your answer. But at least right. it's it's a little more open ended and fair than that. He can work it out out loud for us. Well, And she gives like she can repeat it for mm -hmm. him. Not like. Nope. You get it here at once. Yeah. That's, a, that's how I would have done it. Nope. Mm -hmm. like it. So anyway, I'm not trying to rip it on too much, but. 
fine. Not my favorite riddle of all time. Okay. Any other big thoughts before we move on here? Um, I know we'll we'll get to it. Um, but the stop being noble scene, I think, is pretty yeah. good overall. Um, I do too. But we'll. I think we're about to talk about that a little bit more in our upcoming discussions. Okay. Well, Luke, I, I think you might have some questions. Oh, I sure do. All right, what do you got? How can a spell that points north help you find the center of a maze? And this brings me to my least favorite part of this entire book. <laughs> really? I, I don't get it. Really? Okay, let's say I'm heading north. Okay. And I head north and I head north and I head north. And now it's like, oh, now I want to head west. And so I head west and I head west. And I've completely missed the middle of the maze. But I don't know because I still think I'm supposed to be heading west and north. So the the only thing that it does is help you keep track of which direction is which. So if he has an idea of where he starts and it's better than having no indication whatsoever and end up backtracking and backtracking without realizing it. At least he can tell me, you know, hey, at least I have a feeling that I'm heading in this direction compared to having no way of knowing that because it's dark out, there's no sun. And I, I think it's, if you have an idea of which direction the center of the maze is, it's gonna help you. You're better off having that than nothing is my but overall you thought. would have to have kept track of every single directional turn you made like okay i'm gonna head west and now i'm gonna head let's say we entered from the south right so i head west and then i head north and then i head east and then i head north and then i head west and then i have to go back south again like it's certainly I, a I feel thing kind of, like you'd have to kind of the, guess check and revise up quite a bit Right. I just, I mean, it's, I don't know. And maybe I don't have enough spatial awareness to make that very useful to me. But I, I, I feel like it's it's almost like I want a spell that's a center spell. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like a waypoint, like you I pick a spot. The, find the center. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that that'd be would, real convenient. <laughs> that'd that be a little be too easy, though. Maybe it would. I don't know. I just always had a hard time seeing how did this even become a... Yeah, it's certainly not going to solve the problem, but you're better off than being completely Knowing blind. Knowing where you are in relation to other things. Yeah, if you have a feeling, like, whoa, oh, I've been going east for a really long time, like I, and I'm not finding it, maybe I should try a different direction, and at least you can kind of start revising as you go. Okay. Question number two. Of all the curses that Harry learns, which would, to you, would be the most useful? Impediment, reductor, four points, shield? Well, not the four points, obviously. Yeah. Although, in general, in my real life, it probably would. Let's be honest. I would like to know which direction that, that would help me with, like, traveling. So, that, <laughs> okay, real life. I like that one. But in terms of, like, which one do I think is most useful to the story and to Harry... There's two that really come to mind. And the first one is the impediment curse. So if something's coming at me, I can stop it. It's pretty useful. That would be like the first thing I would try. And then if I can't stop it, I'm going to throw up the shield. Mm -hmm. Those are like the two, those would be my go-to all the like time. one-two punch. It would just become, yep, second nature. I'm going to stop you and then I'm going to protect myself. I think that's pretty reasonable. If I can't stop you, at least I have to protect myself. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's reasonable. I, I'll agree with you. I, I think that's pretty useful. Um, okay. those two. The reductor, I'm sure, is, is definitely useful as well. Um, I'd have less use for it, I think. <laughs> but yeah. I think there's also a lot of things that you can do, because he also uses stupefy multiple times in this chapter. Yeah. Um, usually not to much avail, because it's not really the right, right, the right spell, but um, I, I think the of these, impediment seems the most useful to me. Yeah, cool. Question three. Which was your favorite of the maze obstacles? Blast and Scroots, definitely your choice, I'm sure. Uh, the Golden Mist, the Boggart, the Sphinx, the Giant Spider, or I... Crazy uh, Crumb. <laughs> <laughs> the unplanned obstacle. Um, so I really think the Golden Mist. Yes, you're was correct. The best 
That is, you were absolutely correct. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that was the right answer. <laughs> you were I'm sorry. totally correct. Okay. Okay. And here's the thing. I thought the Bogart was smart. I, I think throwing that in there, that was smart. The blast dead screws are always scary. Big fan of the scary, right? Same mm-hmm. thing with the giant spiders. They came in a couple times, right? Right. Like putting the Sphinx in there, that was interesting. The idea of like having to use your smarts and if it didn't work, then you're going to have to fight because she's going to get you. Like all, of, but they're all things that require physical, a physical prowess, okay. if you will, yeah. a bit, some sort of uh, like attacking or defending. But the golden mist, you have to think your way out of it there is no other option there is no fighting through there's no powering through there's no just like hammer you have to stop and you have to think and that can throw people off in those high stress stress situations that was yeah. my favorite yeah and I, I think the the fact that it forces you to take that leap of faith really right i mean because it feels like you're falling <laughs> off the edge of the world knowing that Basically having the confidence that you're going to be fine, that takes some real guts. You know, it's one thing to fight something and have a chance. This, you can't fight this. Like, mm-hmm. you have to jump out of the plane or you, just or you quit. Like, that's kind of it right here. And I, I think it's a really, really cool thing that, you know, he, he feels the hair falling, you know, straight downward because he's, if he, he feels like his feet are stuck to the ceiling, that is reversal of gravity. And it's pretty neat that it takes that, I don't know chance at sacrificing yourself to to get through it i think it's a i think it's a pretty neat concept yeah i was a big fan all right question number three a bit earlier in the chapter is amos diggory justified in his disdain for harry i mean the answer i'm supposed to say is no because harry is wonderful and he didn't do any of the things that amos said and therefore amos is just wrong but he's a dad i think the way he's approaching harry is wrong I like the way he kind of defends his son no matter what. But then attacking Harry and saying like, well, you didn't do anything to stop it. Dude, he's 14. What do you want him to do? I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't really have an answer. I can I, see. It's, it's a very interesting two-sided argument. Yeah. I, I, I sim- Yeah. Most of the arguments we've had, like with, with Ron and, and Harry early on in the book, right? Their disagreement. I can see where both sides are coming from. We know that Harry is right. Like we know that. We've, we've seen it. But Objectively, he's right. It doesn't mean that what they've seen, the other person, Amos in this case, it doesn't mean that their feelings about it are wrong for the information that they've been given. Especially with Amos being fed by Rita Skeeter. Absolutely. And yeah, maybe it's naive of him, even as Mrs. Weasley points out, you of anybody should know working at the ministry, how unreliable and awful she is. But like that should be taken into account. So that's kind of his that's big miss. Same thing. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Just point that out there. Yeah, very well said. She does pretty much exactly the same thing in, you know, the hot cone the kettle black a little bit on this one, but it, it ends up working out, I guess. And I can see where Amos is coming from. Yeah, I don't like you said, I don't like that he's attacking Harry the way that he is, but I can see where his feelings are coming from, I guess. Yeah. I, I mean I think he acts on his feelings incorrectly. There is a way to be frustrated and there's even a target for it, but it's not the 14 year old kid. Okay. Last burning question of chapter 31 was tying for the cup, the right move. We've had a lot of questions like this of like team spirit and like gamesmanship in this book. Well, seeing as how we're recording this two days before game seven of the Stanley cup finals, where the blues better win. I'm having a hard time saying, yeah, tying is great. (laughs) Because I'm a big fan of winning. So in general, I would not encourage champions in Triwizard Tournament to work together and have two of them. Having said that, this is not your typical Triwizard Tournament because it's a quad wizard tournament Mm -hmm. and two of the wizards come from the same school. And it is the two wizards from the same school who are talking about tying. Because as Harry said, it's still a Hogwarts win. So in my head, it's okay because they both earned it. They worked hard to get there. I like the noble, the noble off that's happening, noble right? Off. Like I'm more noble because you need it. No, you need it. No, you need it, dude. Just like that's what happens when you've got a Gryffindor and a Hufflepuff, right? Like nobody's just going to step up and do it. They're both going to try and out chivalrous the other one. And well, chivalry versus being nice, <laughs> like that's <laughs> it's kind of like. <laughs> Cedric's just nice. Yeah. It's they're really pulling very similar 
characteristic. They are. And it's not a bad thing. If it was any other two Hogwarts students, even that wouldn't have happened. They're just, there's a reason they're the champions. Mm -hmm. it, it, there just is. And it shows it and they both deserve it. And they recognize the deservingness of the other person and find a way to make it about Hogwarts and not about them personally. And I like it. So mm -hmm. I say for this particular situation, yes, most of the rest of the time, no and go blues. Go blues. All right, here we go. Chapter superlative time. Luke, what was your favorite line? So it's been a little while, I think, since I've had a an honorable mention uh, or a, a runner-up line, and I have one this chapter, and I think I referenced it earlier, um, but it is... It was Voldemort, Harry thought, staying staring up at the canopy of his bed in the darkness. It all came back to Voldemort. He was the one who had torn these families apart, who had ruined all these lives. So... That's that's my runner up. I think it's a really good I, I like when when Harry gets mad at, at like Voldemort because it's so justified and he's doing this on behalf of all of these broken families that we've seen. And it's just a it, it's a nice Harry moment, like I kind of mentioned earlier. My actual favorite line of this chapter is right after Harry finishes reading Rita Skeeter's article about him where she's just laying into him, calling him, you know, deranged and attention seeking and a total problem. And his first response as he looks up at Roger Hermione, he goes, gone off me a bit, hasn't she? Said Harry lightly folding up his paper. I just love how he's just like, I don't care at this point. Like it, it makes no difference to my life. Um, she can't do anything to me really. And I just love how nonchalant he is about it. Like, yep. no dirt off my shoulder. Man, it's so different from book one Harry at the morning of his very first Quidditch match, isn't it? Where he can't even eat some toast. Yeah, absolutely. On the biggest stage competition that anybody from Hogwarts can really dream of. Mm -hmm. Dirt school, let's be honest. Yeah. And somebody's literally writing slander about him in the national newspaper. And he's like, whatever, bro, let's just get this over with. Like, I'm good. I've She's had worse. Right, right. Oh, well, yeah. ooh, she wrote bad things about me. Surprise. Yeah. It, exposure <laughs> goes a long me. way, I guess. So what was your favorite line? Both of us, said Harry. What? We'll take it at the same time. It's still a Hogwarts victory. We'll tie for it. You're on. That's my favorite line. We already talked about why. Yep. It's a good one. Yep. How about an MVP? Who was your most valuable participant in this chapter? It's Harry. Gotta be Harry. I, I, I know we very much tried to avoid doing that, but I really think he earned it in this chapter. And nice job, bud. Good I'm chapter. very glad you picked him because I was hoping you would. Mm -hmm. I do have a solid runner up. Yeah. It, it, my honorable mention is not somebody who I think should have been the MVP. And I'm disagreeing with you because I think it should be Harry, but this person deserves a second place. Can we, can we make this an official co MVP for specifically this chapter? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't want to because I think as a chapter as a whole, Harry did more. But for the purpose of the chapter, my honorable mention is going to be Cedric Diggory, right? It has to be Cedric because mm -hmm. he did almost as much. We just didn't, we don't know exactly all the stuff he's been through, but he's been through stuff. Um, okay, that's fine. I've talked myself into it. Co-MVP? Yes. Co-MVP. Co-MVP. <laughs> of Perry and Cedric. I think it has to be. It's specifically because they choose to tie as well. But that and they're both worthy of it. Yeah, they've both earned it and not that like Fleur did anything wrong. You know, she got taken out unfortunately. Um whatever's going on with Victor is crazy, but these two guys uh certainly but figured it out and kind of seem to have figured out at the very end here what's really important. And it's, it's not just competing, it's also doing it for the right reasons. All right, well, that takes us out for this particular chapter. Make sure you find us on Twitter and Instagram at Not Named Podcast. If you have any questions or thoughts, you can email them to us at notnamedpodcast at gmail.com. Find us on our website, thepodcastthat.com. There's something else you can do. This show and all of our shows at thepodcastthat.com are produced with the love and support of our imaginary Legion patrons. Learn more about our reward tiers at patreon.com slash stay imaginary. Be sure to subscribe, like, rate, and leave comments on 
on iTunes. We love hearing from you guys, and those ratings really do go a long way to helping other people find our show. Do the same thing on YouTube, where we've started to live stream record on and off here for these episodes. So check it. Make sure you follow us on Twitter to get those notifications or hit that notification bell on the YouTube channel after you subscribe so that you know when we go live next. Join us next week when we discuss chapter number 32. Flesh, blood, and bone. Stay imaginary. Thanks. Thanks.